Okay, let's go ahead and get started. It's only going to get warmer during the rest of the day. And there actually is, believe it or not, important stuff left. Which is to say, I want a lot of feedback from you guys, so. Um, what we're talking about more and more in the course of today is why are we doing this? Can we kill the big fan? Sorry. No. Why are we doing this? Which is to say, we do the data capture, we create a big database. Is that only going to serve us so that, you know, Moses can write a great paper on the plants of Cameroon? Or can it be part of a more permanent infrastructure for science, especially science on biodiversity in Africa? So that's kind of the question. And what I want to do is give you a couple examples of the difference it makes to share information. So I want to give you two examples. One is about biodiversity data, and the other is about biological literature. And perhaps the, the data question is, is the, the better one, simply because I can give you kind of an endpoint to the story. Um, this goes back to my now almost three decades of work in Mexico with close colleagues in Mexico. Um, and essentially this is about a project that we call the Atlas of the Distribution of the Birds of Mexico. Um, essentially, way back around 1990, um, three of us, two Mexican scientists and I, noticed a pretty serious gap. And that was that you just couldn't get any information about Mexican birds if you were in Mexico. And that seemed to be pretty bad. So we started a big project designed to get all of the information on Mexican birds in Mexico. We dealt with dimensions of bibliography, which started with this first compilation of almost 5,000 literature citations about Mexican birds. And then over the ensuing 20 some years, we've accumulated this data set. So essentially what we've done is we have obtained data one way or another from 82 natural history museums around the world. It's essentially everything, which is to say there may still be some Mexican bird specimens in museums in Hungary. And we've been assured that there aren't Mexican bird specimens in Japan, but there was an emperor's son who was very interested in Mexican birds. And we kind of have this nagging suspicion that there may be a collection in one of the institutions across the country. But basically, we're done. And so this is 400 some thousand records, each of which is a specimen of a bird sitting in a museum somewhere in the world. So this is a picture of the accumulation of records through time. So essentially you can see, you know, about 1888 was a really big year for new specimens. Um, you can see a gap which corresponds to the First World War, for example. And you can see more and more information being gathered. Um, this information, again, it comes from 80-some natural history museums. But just so you know, we, which is to say my two Mexican colleagues, their students, and I, we had to capture by hand more than half of the museum folds of data that are represented in this data set, which is to say we sent students and we went to examine specimens, go through every cabinet in this museum and that museum and that museum, and capture the data. It took literally 20 years. We could do it a lot faster now. VertNet, for example, saves us the time of putting together essentially all of the North American collections. And within Mexico, you have the, um, 
the World Network of Biodiversity Information, DREMIB it's called, and that basically puts together all the Mexican collections. And then GBIF provides access to some of the European collections. So really we could take this 20 year project and maybe do it in five years now, which is a way of saying maybe you guys could do similar projects on your taxa and your countries in a lot less than 20 years. Now, let's go back to this graph. You can essentially see increasing intensity of, of records appearing each year. Here's a cumulative graph. And so essentially you can see early peaks where, where numbers went up dramatically. You can see some flat areas where people were thinking about things other than Mexican birds. But then you can see a pretty steady accumulation of records through time. If we look at those records in terms of my last talk, which is to say where they are in the world, these are the Mexican collections, this part. And all the rest of it is here and there around the world. And this is, this is the cruel reality of biodiversity information. It's very scattered. So, for example, if people around these tables were interested in West African plants, something like that, well, you can expect that the data for West African plants will be scattered across many institutions. That's a scary reality because it means you've got to work with a lot of institutions in a lot of countries and a lot of individual personalities. This is a really interesting dynamic that uh, we noticed for Mexico. Um, and it's essentially, if you look at where these records are um, held, you see this blue line of columns, that's European collections. And what you see is this early pulse in the 19th century where essentially all the specimen documentation is in European collections. But right around that same time, you see North America. These are the green uh, bars. North America, which is to say US and Canada, comes in and essentially takes over the game. Okay? There's an old saying in Mexico that Mexico is very far from God, but very close to the United States. <laughs> and that's for better or for worse. So you see the US come in, enter into the Mexican ornithology field, and kind of take it over. But then most interesting, look at the red bars. In the latter part of the 20th century, Mexican ornithology takes over. You essentially have endemic science going on instead of external science. Now, different countries, different regions may be at different positions in this transition, and maybe the transition is completely different. For example, Africa is very close to Europe and very far from North America. Okay? But it's an interesting sequence because what I see here is science taking off in Mexico. And I can show you another example of that or another way of seeing the same thing. This is the number of publications per year about Mexican birds. This isn't specimens. This is literature publications. And you can see, you know, the, the universal, which is that the literature is expanding massively. But watch this. This is the proportion of foreign authors, non-Mexican authors about Mexican birds. And this is the proportion of Mexican authors. And what you see is that right in that end of the 20th century, you see Mexican ornithologists taking charge of their own destiny. Essentially, you see now Mexican ornithology is dominated by Mexican ornithologists. And the whole point of this is it was right in this period that literature, but especially data, on Mexican birds was being brought to Mexico and being made very widely available within Mexico. So a conclusion is that open access to scientific data 
has broad and important ramifications in stimulating science progress. That's one reason why we do this, okay? That's a reason why you capture data, but you also share it. The data can be considered a common good, okay? It's not something that I possess or you possess. The data are a common good, but it's good for your regions, your countries, and yourselves. Here's another example, and this example is only part way along. Um, who in this group has been frustrated by looking for a particular publication and not being able to get it because it costs $40? Anybody run into that? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, even some people over here. What happened, okay? When I was a, a beginning student, most scientific publications, at least in the biodiversity world, most publications were in society journals. And a subscription to those society journals was $25, $30, $50. Maybe the library subscription was $100. And that was because the academic societies essentially subsidized those publications. They had a mission of communication. Okay, they had a mission of, we're the American Society for Ichthyology and Herpetology, or whatever. And we want to provide a medium of communication to our members and to the broader community. Now, some very smart people who were not in the scientific community realized that there was a big money-making opportunity to be had. What I'm talking about is the publishing industry. I'm talking about the groups like Elsevier, Thomson Reuters, Cambridge, Oxford, Springer, Wiley, Blackwell, etc., etc. Now, what did they do? These are not people who care in the least about ichthyology or herpetology, or about ornithology or about botany. These are people who care, care about making money. And so they did what anybody who has money and wants to make more money does. They bought a good investment, and now they're getting money out of it. So what did they do? They bought some journals. You know, the typical thing is they go to a society and they say, you know, looks to us like you're losing money on your, on your journal. How about if we take care of all of those hassles for you, we do all the publication, and we pay you $10,000 a year. And the society is like, wow. It goes from being something that's a tax on our organization to being a plus. The little detail that you have to remember that you certainly don't know is that for every publication that we do in academia, the average profit to the publisher, the average profit is $5,000 per publication. Profit, that's after expenses. Now, think about my career. I started in the 70s, 80s, and everything was print. And printing a nice, attractive journal costs money. What is it now? It's almost all electronic publication. So think about it. The costs involved with publishing a journal have done this. So you would think that these commercial publishers, if they had a heart, would lower the costs along with the cost of production. They can still keep a big profit margin. But instead what's happened is that subscription charges for now online access to the scientific literature on a per journal basis have gone up 12% per year 
for the last 30 years. 12% per year. If you were putting away money for retirement, wouldn't you love to have some investment that gives you 12% a year for 30 years? I'd be <laughs> retiring pretty comfortably, right?